There's Stan. Welcome back. <laughs> All right, friends. Good more afternoon and welcome <laughs> to a time of day that I don't know what it is. <laughs> My name is Lauren with Second Star to the Right in Denver, Colorado. And we are so, so excited to bring to you today our next panel and our very special event with our local SCBWI Rocky Mountain chapter where we are celebrating some of the amazing local authors who had books released this year, because we all know this year has been terrible. No one's having fun. It's not been good. Everyone's stressed out. We haven't gotten to do the things we want to do or celebrate the things we want to celebrate. So we're bringing the celebration to you. So we have with us today some local authors from SCBWI who are gonna be our panelists. And for this panel, we are focused on picture books. So I am gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists and then one by one, they will introduce the books that they had released that they'll be talking about and then we'll jump right into questions. So on today's panel right now, we have Nancy Bo Flood, Lauren Kirstein, Beth Anderson, Gregory Barrington, and Natasha Wing and Stan Yan as a socially distant duo, <laughs> virtual duo. <laughs> so Nancy Bo Flood, why don't you go ahead and unmute, get us started, and introduce your book. Well, I'm very excited to introduce I Will Dance. Um, this book celebrates not only the joy of dancing, but the joy of uh, community, in, uh, and especially for this young girl, Ava, who is uh, uh, in a powered wheel wheelchair. And from the time she was three, what she wanted was a tutu so she could dance. And it's a story of her journey in that dream. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Nancy. Gregory, do you wanna go ahead and unmute and introduce your book? Hello everyone, uh, my name's Gregory Barrington and my book is Cowboy is Not a Cowboy. And it's about uh, a bull named uh, Merle, and he's got a friend here, a goat girl, and uh, it's about uh, their friendship that comes together and uh, escaping your own holdbacks of fear of life and um, things that may have happened to you in the past, but it's about their friendship and moving forward. Nice. Awesome. Thank you, Gregory. Next up is our duo, Natasha and Stan. Stan, do you want to go ahead and introduce your book? Sure. Um, so we uh, collaborated on Saltwater Sillies. I'm the illustrator, and Natasha is the writer. And it's a collection of uh, family-friendly aquatic jokes. Is there anything <laughs> you wanted to add to this, Natasha? Did I do a good job? <laughs> uh, yes, you did a great job. And Stan did the illustrations, and it was um, a really fun collaboration. So I'm glad we paired up together. Awesome. Thank you both. And last but not least, oh, I'm sorry, not last but not least. I almost forgot. Lauren Kirstein, you are up next. Hello. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for organizing this. I am here with Rosie the Dragon and Charlie Say Goodnight, which is the second in the Rosie and Charlie series. They are tackling bedtime dragon style, and I must warn you that fireproof clothing is not included. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Lauren. And now, last but not least, Beth Anderson, do you want to introduce your book? Sure. I had two books come out in 2020. Lizzie Demands a Seat, Elizabeth Jennings Fights for Streetcar Rights came out in January. It's a similar to the story of Rosa Parks, only a full century earlier. So a really important civil rights story in our history of transportation. And in October, Smelly Kelly and his super senses came out. This is how James Kelly's nose saved the New York City subway. And this is a story of a man with an extraordinary nose who found just the right place to use it to be a everyday, an everyday hero. Wow. Awesome. Thank you, Beth. How about everyone joins me for a virtual round of applause for our panelists? Thank you all for being here to celebrate your books. So I am going to be asking the moderator questions and then I will call on you individually to unmute and answer. So first up, our first question. What inspired you to write this book? And Nancy Bo Flood, we're going to start with you. 
Well, I have been, uh, I've been a follower of dancing. In fact, I started out tap dancing when I was very little. And um, so I was drawn to this uh, group, a uh, dance company in Minneapolis called Young Dance. And what was amazing to me was to, when I read about the, them is that they're all abilities, all ages. And I thought, well, what, what's that all about? Also, my background as a child psychologist is particularly with kids with developmental delays. So I was like, do they really mean that? And um, I, uh, getting, to, getting to meet these dancers was truly a transformative experience. I felt such joy when I watched a class of these dancers. Giggles, smiles, laughter, hugs. Um, the dancers of all abilities were moving across this you know, beautiful dance floor. Some in powered wheelchairs, some with walkers. Um, there were uh, some with uh, prosthetic legs. And they truly were all abilities and all ages. And in all abilities, they were also um, uh, abled dancers uh, of all ages as well. So this community was probably one of the most um, uh, inclusive uh, community I've ever met. Uh, they did, uh, they do, a, they started each of their sessions of their rehearsals or of their classes with a circle and passing the touch. And I, um, I witnessed these children and adults sharing this passion of dance, of movement, of expressing themselves through movement um, and as a strong community. And um, it really transformed my um, understanding of what we as people, what every individual yearns to do is to, to follow their passions and to be in a community where they can share those passions. So that was my inspiration. Wonderful, thank you, Nancy. Lauren, how about you? What was your inspiration to write this book? So I love doing writing challenges. And in 2016, um, is, 2016 is when I wrote the original text, which is quite different than what ended up in the book. But I had challenged myself during National Picture Book Writing Week to write seven picture books in seven different structures. And so whew, that was quite a challenge, but I never shy away from a challenge. So I wrote this as a how-to book. Um, and then with encouragement from critique partners and Write Your Story, they said, you know, it was how to put your mommy to bed. And they said, can you make it more unique? Because I thought it was hilarious to think about all of the antics that we go through as parents. And I'm a therapist, so I've helped parents put their children to bed for years um, with tips and strategies. But it'd be hilarious to turn the tables. So they said, make it more unique. I said, how about a dragon? They said, can you make it even more unique? I said, well, how about a dragon who swims? So that was the first book. And then um, that I revised the goodnight book. And so that original text became, Lucy the dragon and Charlie say goodnight. Um, and so I turned the tables and thought it would be interesting to see what happens when you try to put a dragon to bed. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Lauren. And Beth Anderson, you are up next. What inspired you? Well, for Lizzie Demands's seat, I, when I heard about her story and I, I read just a little bit, I was really in awe of this woman who is quite courageous and extraordinary. And it really was an appropriate text for kids to understand kind of the history of racism and how we keep it going. Um, through time just by repeating our same old traditions and habits. And um, this was an opportunity for all of us to see where we fit and that we all are a part of eradicating racism. Smelly Kelly, uh, like all my books, they start with curiosity, but his story was funny and it was bizarre and it was quirky and it was dangerous. And so it had all these really fun elements for kids not only a superhero, but also a guy with a super quirky sense of smell. So that was really fun. And as a teacher, I love the way that social studies and science kind of intersected as a real world cause and effect and, and played out for the entire story as, you know, his arc. So totally fun for both. That's wonderful. Thank you, Beth. All right, and Greg, how about you? What was your inspiration for your book?
Oh, let's see. Greg, are you able to unmute? Sorry, I didn't hear you call my name. Oh, <laughs> the okay. audio chopped out for a second there. Um, yeah, so fear. <laughs> Absolute fear was the reason um, I came up with this book. So uh, it was, I had a different book. My I was just picked up by my agent and it was out on submission. And I had a, an editor that was interested in it and they wanted, we we're going back and forth with a few changes and I was just fearful that they were going to drop or not pursue that first book. And I wanted to have something else immediate to show them. It's like, well, what about this then? Since I had their attention. And that is why I wrote this book. Now it, it, it went full circle. I mean, completely different as Lauren said, your a manuscript changes so much from the original draft, but it, it was enough to, uh, get them interested and, and actually, yeah, they ended up pursuing this one and, and not the first one, but yeah, fear, use it. <laughs> That's such a good answer. Thank you, Greg. And Natasha and Stan, what was the inspiration behind the book that you worked on together? And just a quick note, Natasha, I believe you also have another book that we did not mention. So if you want to bring that in as well. Yeah. Do you want me to do that first or the salt one? Okay. So the other book that came out this year is The Night Before Election Day. So guess what the inspiration was? <laughs> um, we had a, a big election coming up, and um, it, this is part of a series, a Night Before series. So my editor is like, you know, why don't we come up with something for the kids so they can understand why their parents are, like, so involved in watching television and, and protests and all this other kind of stuff. And so it's, it was just a way to introduce kids to the election process. And my hope is that it will also inspire future voters. So that's why I wrote that one. And then, yay, I know. Then Saltwater Sillies and then Stan could jump in. Um, that was actually inspired by a publisher who did two other joke books of mine. Um, they came up with the topic, so to speak, and I started doing jokes and then they canceled um, the project. So they were going to get rid of their joke line. And hopefully it wasn't because of me. <laughs> but um, but I had all these jokes. So I'm like, I'm not going to let these just go. And I, you know, my mind when it starts getting into it, it just, okay, here's another joke. joke. I'd wake up with another one. So um, I was lucky to meet Stan during a book signing earlier, like a conference thing. And his style always stuck in my head. And when I saw um, he had done a similar version of this as Stan. What was your, what logo for one of your groups, right? Yeah, so I'm in a, a group actually with uh, Dow, Kaz, and uh, uh, Lily Williams, among other people, uh, that, that um, is called the Cuttlefish Gang, C-U-D-D-L-E fish. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, so we're all um, kidlet illustrators. So, and so we, we were all supposed to draw self-portraits of, of ourselves. And I, I thought it would be funny if I drew myself as a flounder, which uh, as it gets older, the eyes um, end up moving to the same side of their heads. <laughs> yeah. So that, I saw that and said, that has to be the cover. So Stan doctored it up into a different form, and that's how we got hooked up together. That's awesome. Thank you. And now we're going to actually reverse our order. So we are going to start with Stan and Natasha for the next question. What was the most challenging part about writing this book? Or Stan, you can answer as illustrating. So I'll start with writing and um, then Stan pick up. Okay. Um, the writing part, I guess the most challenging part, especially with jokes, is trying not to... Um, completely copy other people's jokes. I mean, you can take things that are out there and then kind of tweak them or come up, you know, with new stuff, but it's really hard to determine um, copyright for jokes. So you think you're really clever and then you go and research it and then, oh, someone's already come up with that. So you have to tweak it or, you know, it, it, that part was hard. And then coming up with 300 plus jokes was like the other challenge. Like I'd get up to like 258. They'd be like, okay, I got hope, you know, just keep going through, you can do this. So that was the biggest challenge. So Stan? Um, honestly, this 
uh, was not a very big challenge for me. I mean, the biggest challenge was that, you know, I set the precedent for the illustrations with my self portrait of me as a flounder. So, um, Sorry, I missed that. whoops. Could you say it again? Oh, no. Siri is thinking I'm talking to her. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I must have pressed it in my pocket there. Uh, but anyway, so, um, what, when we ended up, uh, when I ended up illustrating the interiors, we actually crowdfunded this book. And some of our backers uh, were able to get themselves drawn into the book. And I had to draw a lot of them as creatures, like sea creatures, like a shark here. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I guess theoretically that was a challenge. But if any of you know me, I, I draw people as zombies and My Little Ponies and all sorts of other things at comic book conventions anyway. So it's just, it's kind of what I do anyway. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Natasha and Stan. All right, Gregory, let's go to you next. What was the most challenging part about writing your picture book? Uh, fear. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll, go, let's, we'll stick with that theme, I think. No, it, it was um, probably because it's changed so much, I, and I think this is true probably of any manuscript, especially when starting out, is being able to critique your own work uh, as, as it's going forward. It, it, I think in reflection, it's pretty easy to get something that's nice. You know, oh, this is a nice text. This is a nice story, something, but it's hard to get something that is really unique or has a unique voice and being able to look at yourself and your work and being able to see, is this unique or is this nice? That I think is, is the uh, was the most challenging part, and also to be a willing to cut lines that you absolutely love. Um, I know it's a, it's a phrase that goes around in the industry a lot, but I mean there was a, a part that would make people laugh, and I I had to kill it, and it killed me to kill it, but I did, and I got a better story. So there we go. <laughs> Thank you. That's such a good point. Thank you so much. All right, Beth, you are up next. What was the most challenging part for you? Well, for me, the, the most challenging part of any book is when you're dealing with nonfiction, is trying to make it unique, as Gregory said, and special and not just a report on a person. To find that real heart and why it rang with me and why I was passionate about it is always a driving uh, need and it's essential to really be able to make your book special. So with Lizzie Demands a Seat, I had this idea in my head of what I wanted it to do, but I had a really hard time nailing it down. And it took me about a hundred revisions. And when I found an article that talked about how hero narratives are really a disservice to kids because they make kids believe that heroes take care of the hard stuff for us and we just have to wait for them to come along. And I just wanted to serve that and say, you know, it's all of us that need to step up. One person can't do it alone. They get inspiration from those before them and they carry forward that inspiration into others in the future. So that was what I was after. And it was difficult to really nail that down and get it threaded through tightly in that narrative. For Smelly Kelly and his super senses, the research was very, very limited. And all I had were maybe six or eight anecdotes of things that happened to him in the subway. And I could not find anything else on him. So for him, it was trying to find that thread that would be woven through the story and make it all meaningful. And when I started to look at heroes again, I was looking at different aspects of heroes. His senses were like superpowers. So that was kind of the superpower driving thread through the story, but I needed that heart of the story. And so I really dug deep and tried to examine in myself, what is it that makes a hero a hero? And to me, it was not the superpower. It was something else inside that drove them to use the superpower. And so that's really the, the heart of that story, but that's always a huge challenge to make that work through it. What a great answer, Beth. You made me tear up a little bit there. <laughs> Each of us not waiting for the hero. I love it. 
Thank you so much. That's true. Thank you. All right, Lauren, you are up next. What inspired you? Or no, sorry, go ahead. I'm going to be quiet. Now. I'll just let you talk. <laughs> so um, the most challenging part of writing this book in particular was really being able to balance the funny. I really let my Jersey humor, my sarcastic humor fly in these books. And that was both a gift and, um, well, somewhat, as Gregory would say, scary. <laughs> um, and so balancing sort of the sweetness and the tenderness of this friendship with the humor that I wanted to include was probably the most challenging part of writing this particular book. I think in general in writing, the most challenging part is knowing when to pull that inner critic out um, and when to ask that inner critic to please take a hike. And I saw this great SCBWI webinar with Brandy Cobert and Alana K. Arnold. And Alana talked about how she has a chair specifically in her office for her anxiety, like a separate chair. And I think I'm gonna do that from now on with my inner critic. I'm gonna say, you know, you can just have a seat and I will be sure to call you. You'll be the first to know when I meet you. And so I think those are the two things that were most challenging. I like that idea. Thank you. Great answer. And Nancy, you are up next. What was most challenging for you? Well, it, um, a combination because um, it's, it was it's the combination of finding that heart, that fire, and also, but finding my way into the story. Uh, I Will Dance started and uh, was always for me a nonfiction. Uh, and I was trying to figure out how to um, be able to, to uh, share this a sense and awareness that it's not the disability, it's the individual and to see the and see each dancer first for all the comp, all the complexity that every single person is um, and that the the disability is only one part of that but um, I didn't want to evoke in a sense of uh, pity or sadness because that's not what these dancers were about they're so joyful and I also was struggling with, so what is dance? Another question, what is dance? And um, what does it mean to us? And to see them, um, that, they're, that they are, each dancer was in fact uh, inventing and discovering their way of dancing, their way of movement. They weren't, they weren't um, trying to become a, another kind of dancer. They were simply trying to become fully themselves as a dancer. I, I've, I, um, so it was written as a nonfiction, and um, I sat and watched them work and together, struggle together, they fall down, make mistakes, laugh, uh, cry. And finally, one day when I was just sitting there watching them and I had been interviewing each, each single dancer, the whole, the whole book came to me, which was um, uh, an, an unusual experience. <laughs> I was really ready to think, I don't think I can find my way into this story and I don't want to misrepresent them. And I think one of the things that I finally discovered, which is what uh, on one of the reviews they were able to, to, to also articulate this, is that it's a celebration of dancing and the grace within every single body. And um, that's what I was observing and feeling, but needed um, to find the words to express that. So thank you. It's a beautiful answer. Thank you, Nancy. All right, our next question. What was your favorite or most memorable part about working on this book? And Beth, we are gonna come to you first this time. Okay, well, I'll just speak to Smelly Kelly this time. Um, first of all, it was, uh, Let's see what I got here. It was the uh, it was learning about this world under the streets because I'm one of those people who used to look at those grates in the city. I'm a country girl and wonder what is down there. So learning about that world was just fascinating. And then having all the fun with the wordplay. I mean, I just go crazy with alliteration and consonants and onomatopoeia and all that really fun stuff. So that was great fun. And then I also had the fun of the superhero thread. And I challenge any readers to find all my superhero phrases and references within the story, because there's a bunch. And I'm not telling what they are, but I would love to hear if anybody recognizes the various ones. 
that I had lots of fun putting in there. And then the, the last part of it that has just been a pure joy is about a, two weeks before the book came out, I was contacted by some of Smilly Kelly's descendants. They discovered it online and they sent me emails and they have been thrilled and excited that their great grandfather has a book about him and, you know, telling his story. And they have just been, it's been such a joy to see how that has affected them and their embracing of it, even though I did a little bit of fictionalizing things because I didn't have all the information. But to connect with them and see the meaning for them has been really super. And his daughter, um, she's in her 80s now, and she just loves it. So I got to send her a signed copy, and it, it was just, it was frosting on the cake. So my birthday cake, right? <laughs> yes, it's a great answer. Thank you. All right, Lauren Kirstein, you are up next. Okay, so I think the best part of writing this book, since it was a sequel, was working with the illustrator Nate Rag. He is just, um, he's just brilliant. And it really felt like we both knew the characters inside and out. Um, and God, the moment when I saw the cover art and I saw the colors that he had chosen was just like amazingly exciting. And so I think, I think that was hands down just the, the my favorite part of working with um, working on this book was just getting the chance to work with Nate. Even though we didn't talk, I felt like we were collaborating from a distance, and um, he was infusing the personality uh, into the text. And oh, it just yeah, such a partnership. So I think that was my favorite part. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. All right, Gregory, you are up next. What was your favorite or most memorable part? Conquering fear. So, <laughs> no, I, I actually think um, for me, the most memorable part was even before the book was acquired. Um, so before I even knew it was actually going to be a, a real book. And this it had been written, and I know it was out with the editor, but at the same time, we we're having a SCBWI conference. And there was a, a first pages panel, which is when uh, someone cold reads the first few pages of your manuscript to a panel of editors and agents, and uh, they give their opinions on it. And I mean, I was so scared about that, it just to see the reaction. But when you have someone cold read your material, and you have an audience of all these other writers, and they're laughing just at a cold read, that that just will always stick with me. I mean, there are lots of great you know, highs and lows, but that very first moment, it's like, okay, I can do it. And I think everyone gets that, that little moment in them that gives them that, that confidence boost. So that, that's for me, would probably be the most memorable part manuscript. Awesome, thank you so much. Nancy, you are up next. What was your favorite or most memorable part? Uh, working with the working with the dancers, um, I I was also reluctant to even do this book because um, I don't have a physical disability. I I've worked with um, children for all these many many years that are that have different types of disabilities, uh, particularly autism and also deaf. Um, and I I felt like well. Uh, can, you know, can I really do this right? And that that that's that's a big fear. And talking about fears is like I, I don't want to do it if I can't do it right. And so working hand in hand with uh, all the dancers, I every draft I would uh, go over with them. And if anything that I, they felt was wrong or 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 not authentic or not um, didn't represent what they they what for for them what dance meant, um, and so. Of course, one of the most wonderful times is when individually, at different times, when they didn't need to say anything to me, they would come up and say, thank you for writing this book about us, and thank you for getting it right. Um, and thank you for not writing about disabilities, but about us dancers. So. That's so wonderful. Thank you, Nancy. 
All right, Natasha and Stan, how about for both of you, since this is the joint book together, um, what was your favorite or most memorable part? Well, for me, Stan, you were so easy to work with, you know, because I, I love illustrators and I'm not one. So I I I love the um, the energy that happens when you can both work together. Like I know in traditional publishing, a lot of times you don't meet your illustrator, but because we self-published, we were, you know, chatting every day. What about this? You know, um, what about the, this text and type and font and stuff? And so for me, it was um, the thrill of being involved in the design as well. So, um, Stan? Well, I was going to kind of say the same thing. Uh, the collaboration was the most memorable thing. And if you don't mind, I'm going to give away one of the jokes in the book. <laughs> Just okay. a creative point. So this joke, why did the lifeguard blush? He saw the beach bum. So if you see... <laughs> When, when I originally drew this, I was a little bit worried about actually showing um, an illustration with a butt crack. <laughs> I drew it, but I moved it slightly behind the, the lifeguard tower, and I sent it to her, and she actually asked me if I could reveal him a little bit more. So uh, mm -hmm. she basically well, gave, gave me permission to uh, make it a little bit more risque, I suppose, which, <laughs> uh, which was uh, a fun... A fun thing, you know. Since I drew, I drew it that way in the first place, and then and then I got a little bit uh, shy about it. So, so that was that was probably uh, the most memorable drawing that I did for the for the book. You have to have butt jokes in there. <laughs> Always. I'm the demographic for that. <laughs> so wonderful. Thank you. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we are working with SCBWI, the Rocky Mountain chapter today for this event. And so I wanted to ask all of the panelists, because you're all part of that group, uh, how has the SCBWI community influenced your writing, most especially this latest release? And Stan and Natasha, we're going to reverse order and start with you. Um, okay, well, I have been an SCBWI member for 20 nine years so I joined in 1991 and it's helped my career just you know for sheer support networking forming critique groups I moved to Fort Collins 10 years ago and that's the first thing I did is to try to find the SCBWI regional group and um, so they it's I think it's mostly about support um, as far as my latest books there wasn't any direct input from SCBWI but it's all about once you produce something, you have this group of people that are just cheering you on and, you know, social media spreading the word and just, um, and there for you. So that's the way it's been throughout the 28 or nine years that I've been writing and they've been my, my support group. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been with the SCBWI quite as long. Uh, 2014, I believe is when I joined, but, uh, I, I have to say that uh, joining the group, especially the Rocky Mountain chapter, has been life changing for me. Um, you know, and mostly it's it's because of the membership. Um, you know, and, and I think that probably the largest part of that is um, the critique group that I got involved with. So, uh, you know, just like uh, Natasha, I don't think that they specifically influenced this particular publication and, and the illustrations that I've done uh, within it, but it's it's kind of a cumulative thing, you know, because you're absorbing um, wisdom and information, you know, and uh, honestly, like right before this, uh, I hadn't even thought about doing children's books before. So, um, you know, that's why butt cracks resonate with me. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, a, a lot of the sensibilities that I've gained through, you know, reading other people's books and looking at comp titles and things like that have uh, really uh, influenced my work uh, forever going forward, really. So. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. Nancy, coming over to you now. How has SCBWI inspired you? Well, so much, very much the same answers. Uh, I think that Tasha, you and I joined the same year from, of course, 
very different locations. But um, the support, the encouragement, you know, I think I remember um, the first one of the first years someone saying, you know, sharing your writing is you feel like you're standing naked in front of a group and are they going to start laughing at you, <laughs> throwing tomatoes? Talk about scared, right? And I have always felt uh, encouragement, support, uh, yeah, p pointing out, well, it could be better if maybe you thought about these, you know, 2,000 things you might want to do, <laughs> but um, but they're there and they're and constantly giving you um, additional information as well as always the encouragement. It's wonderful. That's so important, that encouragement part. All right, coming over to Gregory. What, what about you? Birdie's very curious as well. She would like to know how SPWI has inspired you or influenced you. Well, it's going to be it's the same uh, as thoughts of what everyone else has said. I, I joined in 2015. Uh, my background was in uh, or is, is in graphic design. And so I, I'm used to publishing uh, and printing. So I was actually thinking of just self-publishing some books. And but I thought, you know, let me check this out. Let me see what they're all about. And I only did one day of the, the fall conference. And I'm so glad I did. Um, it's, it really is about the community, what you learn from each other, and uh, supporting each other uh, and, and just growing. Uh, you know, I don't think this, well, I know this book would not exist. I don't know what would exist if um, I didn't join, but this book is, is SCBWI uh, from national, well, from our regional chapter to our Colorado Springs uh, Connect chapter with getting critiques and growing that everyone had a hand in it. So, yay. <laughs> SCBWI. <laughs> <laughs> so sweet. Thank you, Gregory. All right, Lauren, you are up next. How have you been influenced? So I don't remember what year I joined, but my very first SCBWI event was a First Pages. And I know Gregory talked about a First Pages event. And I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And I don't know that I have sweat with nerves like that in my entire life. And the thing that is most salient to me, beside the fact that my heart, I think, actually did leap out of my chest, um, was that everybody was so incredibly supportive. So even though it was kind of like a, oh yeah, I have a lot of work to do and I don't really know what I'm doing moment, um, I felt so supported by everyone. I've always felt like SCBWI, both locally and at a national level, is is kind of like a life raft in treacherous seas. Um, it just sort of helps you through, especially during a pandemic, um, just watching webinars and feeling a part of a community. Uh, this work is uh, wonderful and amazing and hard. Um, and so knowing that you have sort of this safety net always, uh, there's so much power in that. And then I've learned, I mean, I can't even quantify how much I've learned um, from this group. So. Yes, I don't know if it impacted this book like directly, but it impacted it directly in the sense that I would never be sitting here had I not joined SCBWI and actually learned the craft, which is a rather useful thing to do, so. Awesome, thank you, Lauren. And Beth, how about you? Well, I would just reiterate what everybody else has said about connecting to others and the encouragement and so much positivity uh, and so many learning opportunities that just set me off, places you can find answers. And it really is makes you not feel so alone in this really scary endeavor because everybody gets how hard it is and how scary it is and how emotional it is. You know, the general public looks at a picture book and they say, oh, I'm going to write a picture book. And it appears easy because, you know, what is it? 500 words, 1,000 words at most, you know, and these people really get how hard it is so that when you are struggling, they're really with you. And it's, it's just been a lifeline really like that, like Lauren's life raft. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much, Beth. That's such a great answer. All of those were great answers. And our last question that we have time for today, do you have a favorite line 
character or drawing illustration from your book. And Stan and Natasha, I would say, do you have a favorite joke from your book for yours? Since I know it's a little bit of a different setup. And we are going to start with Lauren for this one. Okay. So my favorite line from this book uh, I remember the moment that I thought of this. You know, you spend how many hours thinking of just the right words for just the right moment as a as a writer. And so here it is. So remember, it's a bedtime book, and so they're choosing books. And so Charlie says to Rosie, who is a dragon, no, Ferocious Nights is not a comforting bedtime story. Let's pick another one. And I think that's my favorite line. I was very proud of thinking of that. And then my favorite spread, just to give credit to Nate, because he's so amazing, um, was the satisfying moment when Charlie finally had to actually use the fire extinguisher. And I just love the joy on both of their faces as Rosie cools off. Um, and that's my favorite spread. So yay, Nate Rack. He is amazing. That's wonderful. Thank you, Lauren. That's a great spread. I love it. All right, next up, we're going to go back to Beth. What was okay. your favorite? Well, in Lizzie Demands a Seat, it was really a struggle to really find the powerful language I needed. And then my favorite line here is probably the one that says, suddenly late for church wasn't as important as late for equality. And it really let me make up sort of catch phrases and find just what I needed to say in a few words. Now, for, and the illustrations by E.B. Lewis in that book, I, it's hard to find a favorite because they're all just so powerful. In Smelly Kelly, my favorite illustration would be the first look at the underground world in the subway. And um, Jen Harney just did a phenomenal job using two different palettes for above ground and below ground. So I loved her work. And my favorite line comes in the crisis of the story, the climax, when the most colossal, most nauseating, most nose-crunching stench ever to hit the subway filled the 42nd Street station, everyone thought Kelly Sniffer had met its match. That's just fun, you know, fun to read. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Beth. That was awesome. Nancy, how about you? Do you have a favorite? I do. And I, 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 I want to applaud the um, illustrator, um, Juliana Swanee. She, she, she just, uh, the, the, she captured the energy, the flow, the magic of dancing. But she also was, um, she, she had the editor ask me several questions about Ava, the main, the, the main character in the book, which turned out to be a fiction book, not a nonfiction book. And I, so I, I interviewed the parents and, um, and, and mentioned that uh, Ava had two moms, that's, that's her family. And I love it that um, in, one, in two different uh, pages, that's exactly what um, Juliana illustrated. And it's so wonderfully, it's just normal, subtle, there and no no big fuss about it um and then i wanted to um my favorite spread is this one that shows um there's ava the, the expression on her face watching those dancers on the stage and and mom has told her imagine you are dancing i don't want to imagine i want to dance and the teacher says pretend you are dancing but ava says i don't want to pretend I want to move. I want to feel the music sway, swing, fly over and under together, not alone. And I felt like the, Juliana just captured that sense of yearning. I want to dance. That's beautiful. Thank you, Nancy. All right, Gregory, going over to you, what was your favorite? Oh, this is like Sophie's Choice. <laughs> <laughs> when you illustrate a whole book, what's your favorite one? Um, you know, it's it's hard to to narrow it down. What one thing that I I like doing um, one point in the book is when uh, the uh, the chickens get out, and I ended up I try to put different layers into the book. So you have the manuscript, and then the art, and then 
more communication and details within the art. So little things like this when Go Girl's trying to stop these chickens with her French cooking and she had chicken specials, but then she realized that's probably not a good idea. So she changed it to specials for chickens um, to try and stop them. But as far as uh, a full illustration that I look forward to doing the most was when uh, Goat Girl here is doing her encouraging uh, TED talk of sorts to uh, Merle and you know to convince him that he could be a cowboy. Mm -hmm. And uh, just going into the little details, you know, we got the parody of Goat Talk, um, the Goat Within book, and just, you know, something that could be a poster that, you know, the power of you, put it up on the wall. And so that's why I think this one here is one of my favorite ones. Awesome, thank you, Gregory. And last but not least, our duo, Stan and Natasha. I guess, like I said, we could do what's your favorite joke, what's your favorite anything? Okay, well, I'm going to start with this, and then we'll go to our joke. And actually, I would like to say the last joke. So, Stan, you would do yours, and I'll do mine. Um, anyway, um, this one, I love Amy Wummer as the illustrator. She's done a lot of them. And so I just love this page, which is always the best part of writing the night before books, is trying to figure out what's dancing in the kids' heads at night. So we have dancing elephants and donkeys. Um, so, Stan, you tell your joke, and then I'll, okay. I'll wrap well, it up. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna say my second favorite one because I already told you guys my favorite one, okay. <laughs> and you know, this was kind of tough. But uh, I think I narrowed it down to um, what did the pirate say to the marine biologist? <laughs> Walk the plankton is because I got to draw these little plankton yeah. guys that look kind of like uh, plankton from SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then I would like to end with this joke because this is a birthday party. So there actually is a birthday joke in here. What do lobsters do on their birthdays? They celebrate. So was that a nice seg seg you? Okay. That is perfect. That is the perfect ending spot. Absolutely. So before we leave today, we are going to have a little special surprise secret thing here. We're going to sing happy birthday to all of the books that were released. So uh, panelists, if you have your treat, go ahead and grab it now. Audience members, if you would like to join in, we're going to sing happy birthday, dear books, um, to everyone. You can unmute at this time so that you can join us in our song. I've got my second star themed candles here with a delicious ice cream treat that I can't wait to eat. So on the count of three, we're going to sing happy birthday, dear books. One, <laughs> two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, Yay! How about another virtual round? Ooh, don't catch my apartment on fire. Round of applause for our <laughs> panelists. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you to each of our panelists for being here. If you did not pre-order your book from this panel or any of our panels today, you can click that link in the chat. We still have copies available. If you did pre-order, we'll be in touch soon to let you know when to expect it or when it's ready to pick up. Thank you again to SCBWI, especially Rondi, for working with us on arranging this event, uh, the whole event today, and each of these panels. We love working with you. We thank you so much. Thank you to all of our audience members for joining us today. We can't wait for the next panel. I hope you all have a great day. At, I'm Lauren from Second Start of the Right in Denver, Colorado. Happy reading, friends. Bye, Stan.